Thank you. And happy Sabbath, Suniva. It feels like forever since we worshiped together. I think part of that is two weeks of camp meeting and then last week being in the park. So it, feel, it feels like it's been a while since I've been in Sunnyvale, even though I know it's only been, I can't say only been, but only been three weeks. But it's definitely good to be back here today. Um, I, hope you, I just hope you're having a good Sabbath so far and that you are enjoying the service. As always, grateful for everyone who makes this service what it is, this church what it is, and uh, all the effort that's put into each service and to each ministry that we have going on. So I'm not going to call names, but to those in the, up in the, in the back, I want to say thank you to those who were greeting us earlier and ushering in God's presence, thank you. And of course, to our music ministry, thank you. Um, as always, I'll solicit your prayers. And so if you would pray for me and pray with me, I would be most appreciative. Now, Father, I stretch my hands to thee, and there's no other help I know. For if thou would draw thyself from me, Father, wherever would I go? You know what's on the agenda for today. And hopefully it's not my own agenda, but what you would have preached in this place. And so I'm asking God that you would connect my mind to heaven, that only what you have revealed would be shared. I'm asking that you'll connect my mind to my mouth so that my words will be clear. I'm asking that most of all you connect me to you so that there'll be nothing disingenuous, no hidden agendas, nothing else, just you and your goodness. So God, we thank you in advance for what you're going to do. We thank you for what you've already done. And we just look forward to seeing how you'll make this thing all come together. So have over me, Holy Spirit, bathe my trembling heart and brow. Fill me with your holy presence. Come, O oh, come, and fill me now. Fill me now. Fill me now. Come, please come, and fill each and every one of us now. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. I received a text, um, actually a couple of texts, after, in the afternoon, actually yesterday, I think regarding the sermon title, um, straight out of context, it was, it was last week in the park that we were sitting afterwards, a couple of us, Pastor Rob, myself, Will, Carla, and, and this was after everything I kind of wrapped up and we were going over some of our music choices, some things that we enjoyed. And I found out that Will Jimenez doesn't only know the hymns of the church, that Will has... <laughs> That his music, our repertoire is, is pretty, pretty, uh, it's pretty wide, and we, we both have a love for 90s music, I would say. And so when we were talking this week about the sermon, uh, about, about the graphic and whatnot, I get a text last night saying, this is your slide. And so um, the one that he sent... <laughs> And so, now some people are saying, I don't, I don't understand it, I don't get it. Some people are like, okay, straight out of context. Um, and so, just for the record, Pastor Rob was completely on board with this. He was like, he was like no, Mark, that's the slide, that's the slide. Will was like, that's not the slide. Like, no, I'm going to send the real one in a little bit. And so, but, but yeah, straight out of context. Um, let's see what we have right here. The verse says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 9, and just bear with me, please, okay? We're going somewhere today. <laughs> Wives, in the same way, accept the authority of your husbands. The NASB says be submissive. I already see a look like, what? Uh, the ESB says be subject, so that even if some of them do not obey the word, they may be won over without a word by their wives' conduct. When they see the purity and reverence of your lives, do not adorn yourself not on yourselves outwardly by braiding your hair and by wearing gold ornaments or fine clothing. Rather, let your adornment be the inner self with the lasting beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in God's sight. It was long ago 
It was in this way long ago that the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by accepting the authority of their husbands. Thus, Sarah obeyed Abraham and called him Lord. You have become her daughters as long as you do what is good and never let fears alarm you. Husbands, in the same way, show consideration for your wives in your life together, paying honor to the woman as the weaker sex, since they, are, since they too are heirs of the gracious gift of life, so that nothing may hinder your prayers. Finally, all of you have unity of spirit, sympathy, love for one another, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or abuse for abuse, but on the contrary, repay with a blessing. It is for this that you are called, that you might inherit a blessing. May the Lord add a rich blessing to the reading, hearing, <laughs> And don't, yeah, I mean, honestly, I couldn't even get through it without, I, I saw one person kind of with the, <laughs> the look on the side of the face, uh, and even I was stumbling over it like, oh goodness, this is kind of rough on the ears. Um, problematic texts in the Bible, things that kind of hit our ears the wrong way. I remember this, so you know that this is chapter three, we're actually technically now in chapter four. It was a couple of weeks ago that this text came up next in our series, and Pastor Rob was like, that's not your sermon. Like, no, don't, don't, <laughs> don't preach that. Um, there, he, he was like, uh, yeah, like, there's, there's nothing to even go with this. Like, we can just go to the next section. Um, I found it easier to prepare a sermon on row <laughs> than to try and preach this. I was like, because... If it's something that's, that, okay, obviously what you preach has to come out of the text. And you also have to either preach yourself into believing it or believe it already. Otherwise, if it doesn't come out of the text, you're dishonest. And if you preach something that you are not yet ready to accept, then you're disingenuous. And neither one of those is acceptable. Even this week, when we circle back around to it, somebody was like, you don't want to believe that. Why are you preaching this? <laughs> and so there have been a number of questions regarding this text. Um, and I know why would, why would we sit here and lift this up? Why would we sit here and look at this? And so I hope that we'll stick together for long enough to see what God might be saying to us today. What God might be saying to us in Sunnyvale. Growing up, um, I always appreciated a good sermon. And I remember my dad would always say that there were a couple of things a sermon had to have, like for it to be a sermon. You have to have your content, of course. If you don't have content, it doesn't matter. I don't care what kind of stories you have. I don't care um, how great the oratory skills are. Without content, it's not going to matter. But you also have to have commitment, like as far as what does it mean for today, you know, and like bring it into the 20th century. Um, or or as, as Pastor Robert say, like a so what, like make it live for today. And then, of course, every, every sermon should have some kind of celebration as far as the goodness of who God is, whether what God has delivered us from or what God is working in our lives today. And then, and then always, at the end of a sermon, there would be an appeal, like somewhere to kind of encourage people to take a step or that next step with Christ. Great sermons, I used to enjoy them growing up because there would often be like a, a solid introduction as far as somebody roping somebody with a story or with an illustration, then you would kind of lay the foundation for the text. And then I would sit there wondering, how can they sit here and take like five verses and preach for 45 minutes? <laughs> or like, how are they able to sit here and talk on like two or three verses for so long? And so just wondering like, that, like what have they been doing <laughs> to be able to sit here? Like I read the same thing they read, but they ended up pulling something or for so much more, something that only took a minute or two to read. But after that, you make points that can convict people on today. And then, you know, you want to make sure you challenge, convict, and encourage people. And then, of course, like I said, you always give them a chance to take that next step with Christ. Now, if I were to lift up or ask you for, outside of Jesus, the two maybe most famous or more or most prominent people in the New Testament, what might you say? Outside of Jesus. Two people, like the most prominent or, or more famous so, okay, I heard Pastor Rob say two names. That you got it. Anybody, anybody else? In the New Testament. Peter and Paul. Yeah, Peter and Paul. Now, one of them could write. Which one of them was, they, was the prolific writer? Paul. He wrote more than half. Uh, he's, he's credited with writing more than half the New Testament. And which one of them would you say was a great preacher? 
It's not a trick question. Okay, if there are two of them and one of them is a good writer. <laughs> okay, Peter, thank you. Okay, come on. Guys, this, these, these are the gimme. <laughs> this is the easy stuff. <laughs> one could be both. Comma, however, I said one was this, so the other one was that. But <laughs> yes, okay. Paul was a great writer. You know, if you go back and read Romans, go back and read that, Paul could write like nobody else. Now, Paul's preaching has some success, but left a little bit to be desired. You remember Paul is preaching in Acts, preaches so long, Eutychus falls asleep, falls asleep, and he dies. Like, I don't care what you say about my preaching, I've never killed anybody with my preaching, so it's not as bad as, Peter's, as Paul's was. Now, Peter's writing is cool, but Peter is a great preacher. Remember back at, in Acts, you know, preaches one sermon, 3,000 people get saved. You know, and then again and again out our Acts, you see Peter preaching and like just all these people just saying, hey, what must we do? We want to be a part of this. So Peter knew what it was to be a great preacher, to be, you know, to, to deliver a great sermon, whatever else. And so we've been in this series on First Peter for about two and a half months now. It was supposed to be a one-off kind of a Pastor Rob growing out of his devotional life was like, hey, I think I'll preach this this week. And then looked at the game and was like, there's more here. There's more here. And so we've been in First Peter for about two and a half months on and off now. We started off with from anxiety to action, then a response from the heart, then the mark of maturity, the real infinity stones, took a break for a second, remember who and whose you are, and then made for this, and then how we counter culture. And last week we were in the park and we took a look at First Peter 4 verse 1. And then kind of like a group discussion, and and then Pastor Rob let that out. But I hope that as you've noticed, when you read 1 Peter, that you can see that though he's a great preacher, that his writing can sometimes go off on tangents, or it can kind of be like a lot of run-on sentences. I know there weren't sentences back then, but a run-on thought. Now, the point of 1 Peter, let's remember, is that it's to encourage people living under persecution, and not from the authorities, but from their social groups, from the community. And it's to remind these same people of their purpose in Christ and their position in Christ. And to remind people that they have been called to win people to Christ. He's encouraging people, but also challenging them. In short, First Peter is really about effective evangelism. It's about effective witnessing. If you go back and look at First Peter in its entirety and look at the recurring themes. Now, when you forget who Peter is writing to today and why, you can lose the context of his message or his words, straight out of context. When we pick up in 1 Peter verse 3, 1, it's pretty clear that Peter is right in the middle of saying something pretty important and saying something pretty long and maybe even profound. He's calling the believers in Asia Minor, many of whom were new converts, to good lives, to lives that are so good that they beckon others to give God glory and to glorify God. That's going back to 2 verse 12. So 1 Peter 3, 1 begins with the words wives, or in some versions, likewise. And it's settled squarely in the context of a broader mission of God. In the same way, or likewise, in some versions. So immediately that sends us back to see what this is a continuation of, what this is a sequence of when it comes to instructions. So let's back up and make sure that we get the big picture in mind here, because we won't grasp how Peter is thinking here unless we see the sequence. Is that all right? Thank you for the three of you who are it's okay with. The rest of you, I guess, are dismissed. My goodness, it's only been three weeks. You know how this goes. <laughs> So going back to chapter 2, verse 11, this is where the thought actually starts. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and exiles to abstain from the, the, from the desires of the flesh that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that, they, so that though they malign you as evildoers, they may see your honorable deeds and glorify God when he comes to judge. In this letter, Christians are exiles or sojourners or refugees, away from heaven, their real home. 
this world is not represented as the home according to Peter. So how are we to live in this world? According to Peter, he says, I urge you to abstain from passions of the flesh that war against your soul. Keep your conduct on the up and up. That way, when they speak against you as evildoers, which you're not, they may see your good deeds, and then they'll glorify God. So the goal of this very extended exhortation, and Peter already has five different things that he tells us to do in chapters 1 and the first part of chapter 2, I think up to 2 verse 3, is that we might turn slander into God-glorifying affirmation. He wants us to help move people from unfairly maligning individuals to them now becoming converts. And so Peter basically says that if we're going to effectively evangelize under these conditions, we're going to have to do a couple of things. And he says, first, if we're going to effectively evangelize, we're going to have to lessen. Can somebody say lessen? Lessen, lessen the tension with those around us. Lessen the unnecessary tension. Lessen the unnecessary tension. Wives, in the same way, accept the authority of your husbands. Be submissive, be subject, so that even if some of them do not obey the word, they may be won over without a word by the wife's conduct. When they see the purity and reverence of your lives, do not adorn yourselves outwardly by braiding your hair and by wearing gold ornaments or fine clothing. Rather, let your adornment be the inner self with the lasting beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in God's sight. It was in this way long ago that the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by accepting the authority of their husbands. Thus Sarah obeyed Abraham and called him Lord. You have become her daughters as long as you do what is good and never let fears alarm you. The conduct that's being emphasized here is a way of winning a husband. May he be won without a word by conduct. The emphasis is not on submission. Look at the broad context. May he be won by word without your conduct. This is an instance of a general principle for all of us laid down for those believers back in the beginning of the section 211. I urge you all, as aliens and exiles, keep your conduct honorable. Right now, the church is in a posture of self-defense. Peter's like, look, we're the new kids on the block, and we actually have the smallest crew of people. So we can't afford to be alienating people or bringing unwarranted attention in these conditions. Remember the, the whole point of 1 Peter, to encourage people and also to challenge them based off of their current setting. So Peter's like, look, your husband may start out asking you or attacking you, saying how ridiculous it is that you've joined this group of Christians. And they may see this conduct as disrespectful. But when they see your respectful conduct in the same way and they see your good deeds, this husband would be so moved by what he sees that the person who is calling you an evildoer is now worshiping God. And the reason that all this matters, or it needs to be pointed out, is that this is a specific example of a general statement for everybody. Are you with me? He's using simply an example of this person, but he's still talking to everyone. When I'm reading this as a man, unmarried, I'm learning right here from what she's being told. When the word is, she's to hope in God, in verse 5, and that somehow she becomes fearless in verse 6, I then make the connection between hoping in God and not fearing for anything. That's not just for wives, right? That's not just for women. So I say that's what I want. Mark Howard, male, unmarried. I want to learn from a woman or a wife who is hoping in God and being fearless. Specific example, but, not a, but, not, it, but it's not limited only to that particular uh, person, individual, or, or demographic. And people say it's legitimate to draw principles from is it, le, is it legitimate to draw principles from a paragraph speaking to women? My answer is yes, because the effort is, it, or the emphasis is placed on winning the husband by her conduct. And that goes all the way back to chapter two. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they malign you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God when he comes to judge. So that's my rationale for why I, Mark Howard, a man, unmarried, can learn from, these, from this example of instructions to wives. They're not just for her. 
they are just applied to her in that very specific context, or that, in, in, that, in that very specific example. I remember I got a phone call saying, are you here? Now, just by the fact that you're asking me, am I here, I'm probably not. But the, the person on the other line says, you know, where are you? I'm like, I'm in the other office, okay. Well, I have somebody I want you to meet. This, this seems weird, okay. She's absolutely gorgeous, you'll love her, and you guys have a lot in common. See, I, I, this is more than 10 years ago, I see you already leaning in now. It's more, it's a nice try. So, more than, yeah, absolutely more than 10 years ago. So, I'm like, I don't really do blind, actually, I don't do blind dates, so I'm good. No, no, just, just take a meeting. All right, fine, sure, whatever. So she's like, she, she gave me her number, start texting, okay. And so at that point, we set up a time for a meeting to grab some food. And so it's going well, like, hey, she leads out at her church in a Bible study for women. I have a youth Bible study at my church. We're hitting it off. It's a good conversation. And then uh, at one point, I'm like, oh, hey, I mean, what are you guys studying in your Bible study? I would love to join. She's like, no, that will never happen. Okay, then. Well, I mean, well, I'm like, my bad. Uh, she's like, yeah, that, that's not allowed. I'm like, okay, got you. I'm like, oh, I guess because I'm not a member of your church? Or and she's like, well, yeah, but no, but I mean, you're also not a member of the group. And I was like, oh, yeah, I guess I can see how that would upset the dynamic of a small group if somebody's on the outside. She's like, well, no, you're a man, and, and, and I wouldn't teach a man. Really? And why not? And from there, it just goes off the rails, in a good way. And so at that point, we're going back and forth as she's pulling up different texts as to, um, you know, no man should be under the authority I mean, of, of a woman. And she's saying stuff like, uh, you know, uh, you know that, that women can teach women and children, but not men. And my eyes are getting bigger, and so we're just going back and forth and so she's saying that she wouldn't be able to teach me or that I, I couldn't join her group uh, because, you know, that would then go against what the Bible says. And I'm like, I'm not your husband. Like, you know, because she, she's saying, wives, be submissive to your husbands. That this, she actually lists up this text. I'm like, I'm not your husband. She's like, and you never will be with your, with your thinking. <laughs> and so <laughs> it wasn't that funny. Stop. <laughs> what about the second date? <laughs> no, there was, there was a second meeting. Yeah. We, I, I don't do blind dates. No, we, we met a couple of times. Like, it was, we, we, we actually became very good friends. We both knew it would never, ever go any further than friendship because it was like, no, like, we have two very different ways of looking at this. Why did I lift this story up? Because her emphasis was so much on, look, the Bible says, the Bible says, you know, wives submit to your husbands. Blah, I don't say blah, blah, blah. I'm just talking about what the Bible says, but... Um, what I know now that I didn't know then is that the focus on this passage has historically been overshadowed. There's an evangelical focus on this passage. I didn't know that at the time. We were looking at what First Peter is actually about, but it's been overshadowed by a perceived biblical endorsement of marital hierarchy, the subordination of wives to husbands. And this is, I can now say boldly, a ridiculous assertion given that Peter is not in this chapter or in this particular portion, addressing all Christians, or he's, he is or all Christian wives, but he's talking to those who are unequally yoked, only lifting them up as an example. In addition, it has to be noted that that word, in the, the, the Greek word, um, I just went blank, <laughs> hupatasso, that the word that we translate as submit or authority, it has two meanings. It has a military usage where it says, you know, set under or organized under like a military commander or a military leader. But the other one is non-military usage. It's a word that conveys a voluntary posture of cooperation or of assuming responsibility or carrying a burden for another. So Peter's advice should be understood within the same framework as a counsel to slaves, and the counsel to, to other people. In both cases, he commends submission, as we say, but really he's saying working together or cooperating. But in neither instance does he actually endorse the patriarchal institution that enforces submission. Are you still with me? Okay. 
We should not underestimate the counterculturism and the counterculture implications of this passage from 1 Peter. Even though it's, it, it wears on the ears very terribly, when you actually look at what he's saying, it's like, wait, that's not what he's saying at all. While the author advises Christian women to behave honorably among unbelievers so as not to stir up unnecessary conflict or trouble, he holds firm that, the, that this Christian wife has the right to her own Christian faith, whether the husband believes or not. And in the Roman Empire of First Peter, this was a very subversive or seditious claim. He's not endorsing their current system. Peter is not trying to set up Christian households. Rather, he's trying to use the current household structure of that time, even with its cultural limitations, to win people to Christ. So today, we can't or we shouldn't use New Testament text to recreate Greco-Roman culture instead of seeking out God's heart in our own culture. Glass somebody is with me. We've got to... When we look at the pages of the New Testament, these are first century expressions of the gospel and of, and of church life. They're not permanent. They are not timeless expressions. They are timely expressions, to be sure. They are spirit-inspired impressions, for sure. But they were and remain first century expressions. We aren't called to live first century lives in the 21st century. But what we are called to do is live 21st century lives as we walk in the revelation that God gave those in the first century and the revelation that God is giving us today. He says in Peter, do not adorn yourselves outwardly by braiding your hair and by wearing gold ornaments or fine clothing. Rather, let your adornment be the inner self with lasting beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, this, which is very precious in God's sight. I'll touch on this more in our, in our last point because just the time's getting a little, a little bit away. But when your life is the appeal, you'll lessen unnecessary tension. There will be some tension as a Christian, but the unnecessary stuff is saying, let's lessen it. And it's saying, look, I'm not endorsing this, this structure, but the structure that you have currently work within it until we can transform it. But next, not only do we lessen unnecessary tension, but we see that we have to level. Can somebody say level? We have to level the playing field. Okay. Peter spends six verses talking to, to wives or lifting up an example of a Christian wife with an unbelieving spouse. Then he gets to verse 7. Husbands, in the same way, show consideration for your wives in your life together, paying honor to the woman, though the weaker vessel. They are joint heirs of the gracious gift of life, so that nothing hinders your prayers. All that time, six verses spent on the example for wives. Now one verse on the example for men or for husbands. He says, husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives. Again, given the context of this section of the letter, Peter's not speaking to all Christian husbands per se, or this lifting up all Christian husbands as an example. Just as he previously addressed Christian wives who are married to unbelieving husbands, he's now talking to Christian husbands who might be married to unbelieving wives. Why does that might sound even this time? But again, this is a specific example that he lifts up, but it's information for all Christians, men and women, that we can all learn from. Notice Peter's phrase, in the same way, sometimes translated likewise. So does this mean that Peter is saying that Christian husbands are to submit to their unbelieving wives, just as he directed wives to, to submit to their husbands? And it can be argued that's exactly what Peter is saying since he uses the same phrase in the same way, or likewise, three times in this letter, 3 verse 1, 3 7, and later on in 5 verse 5. And in each case, the phrase is employed in the context of submission, better translated as cooperation. And more than this, if we carefully follow Peter's train of thought as he provides instruction to different groups of Christians, this cooperation is the ongoing theme. Peter begins by instructing his listeners to cooperate with all civic authorities. Then Peter directs them, as far as slaves and servants, to cooperate with their masters. Next, Peter tells Christian wives in the same way, cooperate with them unbelieving husbands. And now he turns to Christian husbands and charges them in the same way, live with your unbelieving wives. And there are some people here who might be listening or watching or whatever else in today who might, be, might, might push back and say, 
Well, Peter didn't say submit to the wise, but he said to be considerate. And to them, I have to say, there's actually a real issue with that phrase because it doesn't appear in the earliest manuscripts, in the best manuscripts. It seems to have been added later on by a scribe who was trying to soften what Peter was saying, trying to make it just a little bit more tolerable to the people in the first century or second century or whatever else. And so Peter has not been talking about being considerate prior to this verse. So it seems like it's a new thought to add to in the same way. He's been emphasizing a call to cooperation. But even if you say, look, I want to hang my hat on that show consideration, like I think, I think it's there, I think it was an original thought, this is still a gigantic step. In that culture, the male was the unquestioned authority figure in the household and everywhere else. And would have been, it would have been quite startling to the people hearing this. Wait, you're saying that I have to be considerate? But so even with this bad verse being added, it still shows the trajectory of where Christian thinking is supposed to be. And that's away from domination and towards cooperation. Peter refers to the wives of these Christian husbands as being the weaker partner. And he makes this designation not as an insult or as diminishment, but rather an observance of how women were perceived in first century Greco-Roman society at large. Peter's acknowledging, actually, that more than just cultural assumption that you know, women are physically weaker, generally speaking. Or he's, he's also recognizing the greater vulnerability and thus the disadvantages of women in this culture, socially politically, legally, economically. And in doing so, Peter's calling for these Christian husbands, and today Christians in general, to remember this as well. In a culture where women had considerably less privileges and rights than men, where wives could be considered property, Peter challenges basic societal norms of that day. And instead of exploiting or domineering over their wives, which, again, they had the full right to do within this context, Peter directs those husbands treat their spouses with respect and not as social inferiors. The word translated for respect is actually the Greek word for honor. And so basically Peter's saying, because it's the same word he uses when he says honor the emperor. This is how all Christians should behave. In other words, he tells these husbands, bestow on your wife the same reverence or honor you would to the emperor. Please believe that this would be very shocking to the hearers in that day in Asia Minor, and all around the, no, the then known world. The point is clear, in my opinion, that mutual cooperation is not just the pattern of Christian marriage. But in a world today, and still today, where our engagement with the treatment of each other is based on power dynamics born of various social relationships, or power dynamics you know, of, of other sorts, Peter is insisting that there has to be a mutual cooperation and that's the, pasture, that's, that's the posture and the pattern for all relationships that we have you know, within God or with God. It's not just a one-way street. You have to sit here and look at those who are disadvantaged and say, if I'm going to win them, I have to level the playing field. It was last week at the park that we were tossing a Frisbee a little bit. And then after that, you know, got tired, um, then began tossing a football somewhat, and then once the football got tossed, it kind of started getting to a little bit, maybe jogging a little bit, and then catching the football. Then, you know, at that point, Will has this doing all out sprinting and catching the football or trying to. And then at some point, somebody who shot me nameless starts saying, you know, you couldn't catch a ball on me. Or, you know, I'm going to guard you and this and that. And it's like, what are you talking about? Like, stop. And so he says, oh, no, 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 like, 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 let's stand up against each other. So... I'm like, guy, you're like 65 years older than me. Like, like, this isn't, I didn't come out here to hurt the pastor in the park. Like, this is not, so you've got Will with the ball. You've got Jeremiah on one side, no on one side. You've got Pastor Rob lining up opposite me. And then I'm right here. And so it's like, okay, fine. Look, if you want to do this, let's do it. And so, but what he does, it's like, you know, normally you line up if this is the person, you line up right here. Pastor Rob starts backing up. Because he's like, no, you aren't going to get past me. I'm like, why are you so far back? 
But we had to understand that because he's like 75 years older, not very athletic, doesn't know anything about sports, you know, we have to make it more even. And what happened was that I still caught the ball, and then I turned around and handed it out to him and walked backwards, and he still couldn't catch me. Now, after that, it went downhill. I won't lie to you. It did go downhill after that, and we were very, very tired. Okay, what's the point of this? Really, it was just, I have so many more chances to get Pastor Rob from up here, so I had to tell that story. But really, the main point is this, that if we can make adjustments for unfairness, unfairness between two friends, how much more can we do so for others when we're trying to win them for Christ? Spouses, coworkers, friends, neighbors. Regardless of gender, race, ethnicity, or socioeconomic status, be it as husbands and wives, parents and children, teachers and students, citizens and government authorities, or employees and employers. The way of Christ is one not of dominance over the other, but humble service towards each other. And when we mutually submit or cooperate with each other, not out of obligation, but in love, that's the kind of witness that has the potential and the power to open the eyes of those who don't believe in the living presence of Jesus. You can't sit here and say today that we're going to dismiss the talk of slaves obey your masters and say slavery was wrong and that it's now outmoded. You can't say today that there's never a place for civil disobedience because, you know, no, we have to always follow the emperor or whoever it might be, but then hang on to, but women have to still be subjected to their husbands. That doesn't make sense as a thought process to say that some of these are outdated but this one right here we hang on to. It's a mutual submission or cooperation that goes back and forth. That's why he says three times, likewise, 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 or in the same way, in the same way, in the same way. And we've leaned into tough evangelicals as far as trying to put the emphasis on domination as opposed to cooperation. And the gospel, you know, we, we have to be biblically anchored in what we believe, but also culturally aware. And so it's not fair to argue without substantial reasoning that, you know, hey, well, Julie's okay in this context, not in that context, or that um, above all, we have to do this or that. It's like, no, like, let's look at what he was talking about then. Once, once, once again, I'll get back to the Julie stuff later on, because it's not what, we, what it appears to be saying. So if we're going to be effective evangelists or whatever else, we have to lessen the unnecessary tension with those around us. We have to level the playing field, unfair playing fields, and we have to be loving and lovable. Can somebody say loving? Thank you. Loving and lovable. So, less than the understated attention, level the playing field, being loving and lovable. Got that? You got the sermon. You preach yourself the next time. <laughs> Finally, all of you have unity of spirit, sympathy, love for one another, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil or abuse, but on the contrary, repay with the blessing. It is for this that you recall that you might inherit a blessing. As a church, maybe not locally, but I would say as a denomination sometimes, often, as a worldwide church or the ecumenical church, we've majored in minors. What am I saying? So, because I, I said so before, we would get back to the stuff about jewelry. You know, it says, do not let your adorning be external, that NASB has the proper emphasis, merely external. Don't let it just be that. Braiding your hair, wearing gold jewelry, or putting on fine clothing. Rather, let your adornment be the inner self with the lasting beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in God's sight. Once again, information for all of us. The badge of Christianity isn't some outward sign. It's not wearing a cross or a crown, but it's what is revealed by our union with God, by the power of God's grace manifested in each and every one of us and transforming human character. And the world will be convinced that God dwelt with us to redeem us based off of how we live sometimes. And nothing is as influential as an unselfish life. One of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite authors is, the strongest argument in favor of the gospel is a loving and lovable Christian. I remember making a comment some time before that was taken kind of out of context, <laughs> that it's hard for me to enjoy a sermon or listening to a sermon, not because they're not good, but because I spend too much time trying to analyze it or trying to be like, 
you know, oh man, how come I didn't think of that? Or how would I do it differently? Or, oh man, like, you know, okay, and then whatever else. So it's just the way that I'm wired when it comes to, once, once somebody comes up here <laughs> and they're behind a the desk, it's, I, t I try to turn off all the critique or all the analyzing, like just sit back and enjoy it. But somebody who knows a whole lot about sermons, like I said once again, you have to have content, you have to have commitment, you have to have celebration, and you have to have an appeal at some point to win somebody over. That, that's, that's what makes for a good sermon. Growing up, there was never a time that a sermon ended that I did not hear something like the doors of the church are open. Basically telling somebody, okay, whatever, wherever you are, you can take that next step. And I can imagine that this is also Peter's MO because once again, he is, I would say, the preeminent preacher of his day. But even Peter says, sometimes the sermon is not going to be enough. What Peter, when you look at the entirety of 1 Peter, the whole point of it all, he's saying that some, you're not going to scare everybody into choosing Jesus. I don't care how scary your charts are or what kind of pictures you've drawn. Some people are not going to be scared into choosing Jesus. Some people are not going to even respond to the best preached sermon. I don't care about the oratory skills or how clever somebody is or how humorous they are. Some people are not going to respond to that. Some people are never... <laughs> especially in the Bay Area, going to accept your handout, your glow track, or your desire of ages, or whatever other literature you have. Some people, that's just never going to do it for them. Some people, even if it's the best of music, they're just not going to be responding. But what Peter says, when you look at the entirety of his text, is that what some people will be won by is that not from a sermon, not from a song, not from literature, but when your life is the sermon, when your life is actually the appeal. The song says, let me be filled with kindness and compassion for the one, the one whom you loved and gave your son. For humanity, increase my love. Help me to love with open arms like you do, a love that erases all the lines and sees the truth. Oh, that they would look in my eyes, that they would see you, even in just a smile, that they could feel the Father's love. And Peter says, sometimes we're going to have to stop talking. Sometimes we're going to have to stop preaching and being pushy. Sometimes we have to stop sending that verse of the day text, or thus saith the Lord, quote, whatever else. And sometimes we're just going to have to let our living be the appeal. The whole point of 1 Peter is how to effectively win people who look at Christians with a suspicious eye or a jaundiced eye. And they're saying, there's something different about them. I'm not sure I like it. But because our living is the appeal, it's like, okay, actually, we can take this. Wives, in the same way, be subject to your husbands, so that even if some of them do not obey the word, they may be won over without a word by their wives' conduct. When they see the purity and respect of your conduct. Verse 7, husbands, in the same way, show consideration for your, for your wives in your life together, paying honor to the women, though the weaker vessel. They are joint heirs of the gracious gift of life. Finally, all of you have unity of spirit, sympathy, love, and one for one another, a tender heart and humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or abuse for abuse, but on the contrary, repay with the blessing. It is for this that you are called, so that you might inherit a blessing. His whole thing is saying, remember why you were called, to win people over. The silly stuff in the workplace, lessen the tension. The silly stuff in your neighborhood or on your, on your block, lessen the tension. The stuff that just works your nerve, you know, with the people in your community, lessen the tension. You'll have a better chance to win them over. Level the playing field. Don't sit here and enjoy your privilege, whatever it might be. Boss lady to employer, you know, teacher to student, um, male to, to uh, man to woman or else. Don't just sit here and enjoy your privilege but actually level the playing field and recognize that the, how God sees all of us. And most of all, be loving and lovable Christians. When our lives are the appeal, we'll lessen unnecessary tension. When our lives are the appeal, we'll level the playing field. That's unfair. When our lives are the appeal, we'll be loving and lovable Christians. And when our lives are the appeal, we just might start taking 1 Peter 3 in its context. Thank you.